Let's start off with an IQ test, why don't we? You wanna do that, a second IQ test? Again, in the first service they messed up, they started taking it out loud. Do it silently, okay? You'll see why in a second. Here we go, a little IQ test. When driving, how often do you use your horn? A, rarely if ever. B, as needed, at least once a day. <laughs> or C, it is the most used part of my car. Again, answer these to yourself. While waiting, here's the next question. While waiting in an express checkout line at the supermarket, I A, meditate quietly and visualize world peace. B, count to see if anyone has more than 12 items. <laughs> C, threaten anyone who looks as if they're going to use coupons. <laughs> Last question on this IQ test. At a restaurant, how often do you complain about food? A, never. B, only if it's cold or there are too many bugs in it. C, regularly, and I go out to my car and honk the horn until they get it <laughs> right. Now, that IQ test is not gonna measure your intelligence, but it will in me uh, measure your irritation quotient. How irritated are you? Because a lot of times in life, you know, it's not the big things that get us. It's those little things that pile up time and time again that get beneath our skin, and we feel Irritated. You know, the Christmas season is kind of that way too. And when you think about it, right, it's, it's supposed to be the season of hope and joy and love and cheer, but instead it's chaos, confusion, and craziness. And we're all on this mad sprint to make it to the finish line that's December the 25th in one piece. One piece. And many times, during this time of the year, and as we embark on a brand new year, 2022, we are searching for something that seems to be so elusive. And that thing we search for so many, many times is called peace. Peace. Peace always has supply chain issues, doesn't it? Peace. Now, for a long time, I, I, didn't, I had some really erroneous concepts as to what peace was all about. And so many times we understand what peace is by understanding what peace is not. First of all, peace is not some idyllic place you can go to. I, I thought that for a while. You know, peace would be, you know, you know <laughs> lying on a hammock somewhere in the Caribbean Sea, sipping on a pineapple drink with calypso music gently playing in the background. Now you're saying that sounds nice. It does sound nice, but that's not necessarily peace because wherever you are, that's where you are. So you can be at some beautiful, idyllic place and still not have peace. Peace is also not something we can find by seeking for it in a substance or a sensation. Many times we feel so confused and frustrated in life and chaotic and crazy, we think, man, I'm gonna find peace in this bottle, in this substance, in this sensation, but it doesn't bring us peace, no. It brings us chaos and more confusion and pain. Many times we do a lot of dangerous, stupid things searching to find a sense of peace. Peace is also not the absence of conflict. I thought that that's what peace was. It's merely the absence of, of conflict. I remember when I was a little kid growing up in elementary school, we had a principal by the name of W.A. Woodruff. He was about eight feet tall, and that's what it seemed like back then, right? You're just in elementary school. He's about eight feet tall. He had white hair, crew cut, black, you know, what's that guy's name, Carey, Jim Carey, not Jim Carey, Drew Carey, glasses, right? White, I mean, black slacks, white short sleeve t-shirt with a black tie, looked like an old Mormon, and 
Everybody was afraid of W.A. Woodruff. Everybody was. He was an intimidating presence and force in our school. And so we would be having our time at the cafeteria, and we're sitting there eating or having a food fight or whatever the heck we were doing, and all of a sudden the door would slam, bam, and in would walk W.A. Woodruff. And there was a hush that would go across the entire cafeteria there in my school. And he would kind of look around the place, you know, like he was, I don't know, God or something, and Everybody was afraid, shaking in their boots, right? Until finally some brave third grader would kind of lean out there from the cafeteria table and go, Mr. Woodruff, peace. Because this is the early 70s, all right? Kids, ask your parents. And Mr. Woodruff would go, Peace. And everybody would laugh and be relieved, and we would go on with our lunchtime. No one wanted to be in conflict with Mr. Woodruff. But that, as great as it was, was not peace, not true peace. Peace. It's interesting, when you look at the birth of Christ, it's all about Peace, 700 years before he was born, the book of Isaiah, it was prophesied that God's going to send someone, a Savior, who will be wonderful counsel, wonderful counselor, I can say that, wonderful counselor, King of kings, and Lord of lords, and the Prince of Peace. The angels said to the shepherds, to Mary, what's that passage there in Luke 2? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace on whom his favor rests. But when you think about it, there was no peace. There was no peace in the land when Christ was born. Caesar Augustus was in power. He called himself the son of God. King Herod was the governor, if you would, or the mayor of where Christ lived. King Herod was so vicious, he had two of his own sons executed. One Roman said, it's better to be Herod's pig than it is to be his kids. Then you had the legalistic, Bible-thumping Pharisees breathing up your nose. There was no peace in the land when Christ was born. He was born in a very strict, uptight, authoritarian, communistic, if you would, type of country. But it was predicted that he would be the Prince of Peace, that he would bring peace on earth. When he rose again and ascended, there was not peace in Jerusalem. There would be a rebellion many years later. The, the Romans would quell that rebellion and destroy the entire temple. There was no peace. There was no peace in the Middle East. So what is he talking about? Peace on earth. Prince of peace. It's interesting, though, if you book in the life of Christ, it's all about peace. Peace on earth. And then After the resurrection, he appears in the upper room through the disciples who were chaotic, who were irritated, who were bothered, who were afraid, who didn't know what was going to happen next. And when Christ appeared to them, what did he say? He said four words to them. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. He could have said four other words as these people went out to face the brutal, tough Roman world. You know, he could have said, hey, here is some money. He didn't say that. He could have told them, think positive thoughts always. That'll do it. He could have said, you will never suffer. But Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say that at his birth. He didn't say that after the resurrection. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Paul said it in Philippians 4, I will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace. Peace. Where do we find this peace? How do we access this peace? How did the early followers of Christ who face so much pain, so much heartache, and yet 
succeeded and thrived in such a way that the world can never imagine. How did they find that peace? How can we find that peace even during this crazy, chaotic Christmas season? I think it's by clinging, clinging to two things. First of all, it's clinging to the providence of God. We don't hear a lot about the providence of God, but when you read the old school writers and people who lived before the 20, 20th and 21st century, you have a lot of scholars and Christians and missionaries and pastors and Christian folks who talked about the providence of God, that God is working all things for his purposes and for his glory and for his honor, that basically, even though it may not look like it, God still reigns. That's what we hold on to, we cling to, to have a sense of peace, that God rules and reigns. What God started, God will complete. I hold on. I cling to his providence, and I also cling to the second thing, and that is the very presence of Christ. The very presence of Christ. Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. We have to live in the now and live in the chaos and live in the irritation of this world and this time, but as we do that, we cling that God is providentially working in this world and God is providentially working in my life. And I cling to the reality that he truly is Emmanuel, God with us. And with those realities, those truths, living and breathing in my soul and spirit, we have a sense of peace. Or as some people like to say, I can't explain it, I don't understand it, but I've got a peace about it. I've got a peace about it. So as we look to finish out this race called Christmas, it is my prayer that all of us here would receive and live in the peace of God as we cling to his providence, as we cling to his presence. Let's pray together. God, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you are here with us right now. God, I know that you're with us right now as we're in this place of worship, as we're singing, enjoying community and song. But God, as we jump in our cars and face the rest of our day and face this week and Christmas, God, I know that you're still with us. God, I know that you're with us during Christmas seasons when things are very, very tough and painful and God you're with us in the seasons when things are great and wonderful you're with us always God help us help me to cling to your providence and your presence we thank you God thank you for coming to us thank you for showing us the way we trust in you we give you this time of invitation in Jesus' name.